And so I shared a little bit about myself, so I'm not gonna spend much more time on this particular slide. Uh, if you have questions, everyone's muted for obvious reasons. If you have questions, there are two ways to get those questions to me. You can raise your hand, at which point I will unmute you and you will have the floor. And you can see that feature here. The second way is to send your question via chat. When we have a break in the action, as long as I'm not behind on time, we'll have time to answer some of those questions during a poll. If not, I'll try and get to them uh, at the end during a, uh, a, a, a Q and A. So three things, remember, it's the big payback. Three things that I want you, I want to have happen by the time we wrap up this webinar today. I want you to know how non-fiduciary PBMs make money. If you don't feel something other than indifference, I know that not everyone is going to leave this webinar today and try and change the status quo. I know that. It's unrealistic of me to think such. But if one person does, if just one person does, then it's a win. Feel something other than indifference about the status quo. And then I want you to do something. I want you to start tackling information asymmetry also referred to as information failure. Price is a concern for nearly every purchaser of PBM services, for nearly every plan sponsor that offers a pharmacy benefit. However, the primary problem or the primary reason that price is such a concern isn't that drugs necessarily cost too much. It's the reluctance of PBMs to share the valuable information that they have to their clients. And with that information, clients can start to make way better decisions around the pharmacy benefit. Now, listen, you have to be, you have to trust me. That's why I told you about my background. You have to trust me on this. Listen, to offer a pharmacy benefit is never going to be cheap. But it can be reasonable. It can. We've seen it. A big part of the cost of, of a pharmacy benefit isn't the drugs themselves. What we found the biggest chunk of the cost at the end of the year is what the PBM is keeping in their sticking bank account. And for that reason, they want to make it extremely difficult to determine what you're paying them for the service that they were hired to perform. I talked about information asymmetry or information failure. It just essentially means, essentially means this. When one party has access to information that another party doesn't have access to, the party with the information, and as important, the party with the sophistication required to interpret that information uses it to its advantage over the party that doesn't have access to that information. This is a sample quarterly rebate remittance report that we send to all of our clients for their rebate payments. Now, some of this information has been de-identified for obvious reasons. But everything on this screen is populated when our clients receive this report. Do you know that most plan sponsors, when they receive a rebate uh, payment from a PBM, it is usually just one a one lump sum of dollars. 
there is no report that is provided with those dollars that breaks down how many claims were eligible, which, and, and, and by eligibility, I mean at the claim level, at the NDC level, and then what that claim was paid by the manufacturer to the PBM or to the rebate aggregator. Non-fiduciary PBMs don't want you to know that information. We're gonna talk about why here in a second. So here's the status quo. You can book it. Whenever the PBM is charging an artificially too low admin fee, and I'm suggesting that anything below $4 is artificially too low. But on the flip side, you can't that just because a PBM is charging more than $4 per claim, per claim, that it is offering radical transparency. It could be more transparent than the PBM next door, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it isn't hiding cash flow somewhere. It isn't disclosing how it's getting paid. And so when that admin fee is artificially too low, 25 cents per claim, 65 cents per claim, you, you factor it out to a PEPM, I don't care what you do. It's going to come out to a per claim one way or another if you want to factor it out that way. A buck 50 per claim, 250 per claim. No PBM can pay the bills at that price point. You can't pay the bills at that price point. So what they do is we're going to charge you low admin fee or we're not going to charge you a dispensing fee or both. Or we're going to ask you to forego your rebates completely and then we're going to reduce your medical admin fee. We're going to move that money over to your medical and we're going to reduce your admin fee on the medical side. Same game, different name. That gives the PBM a blank check to augment that artificially too low admin fee, making it difficult for your client or for you to determine what you're paying the PBM for the service it was hired to perform. I just shared a slide with you on how PBMs make money. Here's a second slide, different source. I like to provide sources. You know, in healthcare, people just talk so much junk. Rarely is it backed up. Everybody's the best at everything. In the early 2000s, I've seen this before. Help is on the way for specialty drugs, by the way. I've seen this movie before. In the early 2000s, generics were on the fence. Like, you know, do they, are they as efficacious? They don't work as well as brands. You know, it, that's what was happening in the early 2000s. Uh, and PBMs were generating the bulk of their profits from brand drug rebates. What happens is when PBM clients get smart, they try to close off that cash, uh, that cat revenue stream to the PBM, then the PBM shifts it somewhere else. Remember mandatory mail? PBMs shifted it there, right? And so now, that was closed off, and you can see PBMs shifted it to specialty drug rebates. That shift is already on again. So as you get more sophisticated, the highest level of sophistication is being ahead of the PBM or where the PBM is, closing off these hidden revenue streams before they can take advantage of them. P 
non-fiduciary PBMs know it takes their clients five to 10 years to catch on. Some never do. And now it is the medical benefit drug claims. So if we were to factor this out, right? If we were to move this out here, this is going down here, it's closing and bam. And we call that MBDCs, medical benefit drug claims. It's the wild, wild west. No one's paying attention to it. You know what I've learned? You, you know, I could read a book and I've, I'm getting better at not doing this anymore because I've experienced it so much. I could read a book and there could be something profound or provocative that I've read that I kind of glossed over, that I didn't pay any attention to, only later to be bitten by something that I should have avoided based on information I had gathered prior to. I say that to say, right now, medical benefit drug claims. There's a reason PBMs and carriers now are, are consolidating. And by the way, you don't need to own a carrier to be able to offer an integrated medical and pharmacy benefit. You don't need to do that. It's easier if you own the carrier, but you can still do it if you're independent, kind of standalone. But I'm telling you right now that the shift is on and it's here. And these drugs are essentially being priced at whatever they want to charge because there's no oversight. The new path says this. PBMs make money one way through the admin fee. In the contract language, it has to stipulate that the PBM is forbidden from making money any other way. And so now instead of an artificially too low admin fee, the admin fee is reasonable, starting at $4 per claim and going up from there, no matter what you use, methodology, you know, PEPM, PMPM, whatever you use, it's gonna come out to $4 per claim and then go up from there. And so the benefit now is that generally, you can never say always in the PBM industry, but you know, but generally, it's a better value for the plan sponsor. Let's talk about the PBM business model really quickly. I'm going to start with the contractual relationship, and then I'm going to touch on the financial flow. One thing I want to point out here when you look at this, this slide is unless the PBM owns a mail order or specialty pharmacy, we never take control of the product. There's a reason, you know, if you own a mail, if you own a specialty pharmacy, particularly, why PBMs don't want members getting drugs outside of, of that specialty pharmacy, going elsewhere to get those drugs dispensed when it could be more beneficial to the plan, why they won't let you carve out. But I say that we never take control of the product. Think about that for a second. For 97, 98%, if you exclude mail, if you include mail, 90% of all drugs that are dispensed we never take control of the product. It's never in inventory for us. PBMs, we contract with pharmacies in order to have sites from which prescriptions can be dis dispensed to our plan participants. We have to have clients who provide those services too. Those uh, clients are uh, third party payers and health plans. Now the financial flow, 
we reimburse pharmacies for the prescriptions that they dispense. And then we bill the client for those dispensed prescriptions. There's three problems here. And I'm not trying to sugarcoat this. I'm telling you where the problems are. It's much difficult, much more difficult to fix them because you might have to be willing to take some risk. Three problems. The first one, the inflow of cash in the form of rebates back to the PBM's client is too low. I just showed you where the bulk of PBM profits come from, manufacturer revenue what some refer to as just rebates, which leaves money on the table when you refer to those dollars as just formulary rebates. Because, and we'll talk about this, but those dollars have different names. They've been renamed and assigned different names so that it helps the PBM avoid being contractually obligated to pay those dollars back. And listen, I just got off the phone. You know, we talk, uh, you know, competitors, you know, and we talk. And I, I just got off the phone just yesterday with a competitor who said and talked about how my company and his company are so perfectly aligned. And I'm thinking to myself, has something changed recently? Just today. I receive in my inbox, com pure coincidence, a copy of this competitor's contract. It took me, and, and I had seen it before, so don't get me wrong. I had seen it before. It took five minutes to find where the money was less than five minutes part of it was in the in the rebates too low the second problem is is that the outflow of cash from the pbm's client back to the pbm for ingredient costs is too high rebates are too low or manufacturer revenue is too low Cost of goods, ingredient cost is too high. We'll talk about what attributes that here in a second. But the, here's the third problem, and it's a big one. Everybody has a part to play in why the U.S. Uh, uh, pharmacy reimbursement and distribution system is so inefficient when it comes to the plans and here's the third problem, that fund the entire thing. The money is flowing from here down. The problem is, is that you and your clients are funding the whole system, but know the least about how it works. Think about that for a second. You're funding the entire system, but know the least about how it works. I talked about the second problem. The outflow of cash from the PBM's client back to the PBM, from the third party payer back to the PBM is too high. That can be attributed to what's referred to as the spread. Let me be clear on what a spread is. A spread is the difference in price between what the PBM has billed the plan sponsor, billed the employer, and what they've reimbursed the pharmacy. Any difference isn't a billing error. 
a billing error is when you've negotiated a certain discount and the peep off of AWP uh, or Mac and what the PBM uh, bills is different than that. That could be accurate, but still the PBM has reimbursed the pharmacy a, uh, a higher, uh, a lower cost. That leaves a difference. That leaves money on the table that non-fiduciary PBMs keep for themselves. Let me show you how this manifests. It's th the only way to know if a spread is taking place, you gotta have two things. You gotta know what you're being billed, easy enough, and you've gotta know what the pharmacy's being reimbursed. Remember I talked about how PBMs make it difficult to ascertain their fees. When the PBM bills, uh, reimburses the pharmacy more, I'm sorry, less than what it bills you, that is a fee. That is a management fee. That's what happens when they say, we're going to charge you 25 cents admin fee per claim. That is the blank check that they have been given. So let's take a look here real quick at level thyroxin, 100 uh, micrograms here, AWP 561. So let's use AWP as a, as a price benchmark here. AWP 561. You know what? Let me back this up here. AWP 561. All right, let's put Mac in this as well, right? 561. Now, and these, this is something I post on my blog every week, every Thursday. We update these products. We move some in and out. Just to give folks an idea of ingredient costs, what the pharmacy paid to put a product on the shelf, and the AWP. Level thyroxin, 561. Let's say that the negotiated discount off of AWP, let's call it the, the uh, generic effective rate. Effectively, what is the discount you're giving me off of AWP for generic drugs? Let's say, in this example, 85%. For something. So let, let's say that that generic discount is $475. I'm going to round this. So let's say now that the plan's cost is $85. Right? So the discount is $475 off of an AWP of $561. So the plan's cost is $85. Take a look at what this product costs the pharmacy to put on the shelf. This is not made up. This is not made up. You, you know and I know that clients are out there paying in some, some cases an effective, a generic effective rate in some cases, below 80% for generics. Or right around 80, 81, 82%. The PBM is backing the Brinks truck up to the bank. The PBM, and listen, I've owned a pharmacy. Pharmacy owners will tell you that the reimbursements coming back from PBMs to them, in some cases, they lose money. They lose money. They would be through the moon if they could get a 100% markup reimbursement back from the PBM. Through the roof. Just through the roof. It's static. But let's give it to them here. So let's say that the PBM reimburses the pharmacy for this product. It costs them four bucks. Let's say the PBM gives them eight bucks. Let's say the PBM gives them eight bucks. You know what? Screw it. 
Let's make it 16. That still leaves sixty-nine bucks spread. Now, remember, PBMs control the Mac list, what products are on the Mac list, and what the prices of those products are going to be on that Mac list. Mac list can change like gasoline prices. This product, let's say on the Mac list, let's say the pro the price is 20 bucks on the Mac list. $4 spread. That's how spreads happen. To prevent them, you need information. Information that non-fiduciary PBMs in many, not all cases, are one willing to share. Uh, Mail order pharmacy excessive markups, uh, uh, background study, background on this study. Uh, we didn't con complete this, uh, Creighton University School of Pharmacy. You ever wonder why prices at GoodRx are less than the insured person's, uh, are per person's prices? They're insured, but the cost is higher than what you would find at GoodRx. It's the same principle here. The PBM is adding cost to the product, too much cost. PBM shouldn't be adding any money to it. They should be charging a flat fee for their service, period. So in this example, a Tenololol 50 milligram, the price through mail, you just can't assume that through mail, it's going to be less costly. It depends on the contract. It depends on the contract. It is not always true. So through mail, 38 bucks here, that same prescription on the same date, same NDC, uh, same quantity, everything the same. $8 in the community pharmacy for a difference of $30. And here's the background study on, on, on uh, uh, background information on that study. Contract language, again, I'm putting out a blog today as soon as I wrap up this webinar about this. It's touching on this very issue. The number one factor in whether an employer overpays or pays a fair price starts with this. In PBM spreadsheets, two plus two does not equal four. Spreadsheeting should not be what determines who has the best offer on the table. It should not be the number one factor, let me put it that way, in determining which PBM has the best offer on the table. It is the contract language, which should be number one. That is until you know, I showed you that article, you know, new model, the few, you know, the model, you know, more transparency is on the way new model PBMs, right? Until we get to that point where the market is saturated with PBMs offering radical transparency or a fiduciary standard, contract language has to be number one. It should be given the most weight. The contract language leads the reasonable person to believe that there is only one MAC list. There are multiple MAC lists. The MAC list that you have could be different than the one between the pharmacy and the PBM. What do you think happens there? Spreads. Ask your PBM, how many MAC lists do you have?
the employer's MAC list is going to be less comprehensive and less aggressive, meaning it's going to cost you more and the PBM is going to pay the pharmacy less, keeping the difference. When a PBM tells you, oh, we don't do spread pricing, we're passed through. It's been my experience that 90% of the time, it ain't true. The people telling you that have no, imp they're only telling you what they've been told to say. Contract language will give the sponsor an impression that there's only one rebate. There are multiple rebates. If your contract addresses formulary rebates, but the, the PBM has negotiated or the rebate aggregator has negotiated with the manufacturer to use dollars coming from the manufacturer back to the aggregator or the PBM to label those as administrative fees, guess what? They are rebates. They were paid to the PBM based upon that drug's performance in the PBM's plan. But the PBM now isn't obligated to pass it back to you. And so when the PBM says we're passed through, in their minds, they are passed through. They are passing through to you what their contract uh, uh, contractually obligated to pass through to you. Remember I said I like to show proof. Remember I said I like to show proof. Dirty laundry. A couple years back, and it takes some time for this stuff to all kind of play out. But a this was revealed two, about two years ago, year and a half, two years ago. Express Script sued Kaleo, a specialty, a, a biologic manufacturer, or specialty drug manufacturer. For rebates, it believed Kaleo was, was uh, obligated and owed two Express Scripts. Kaleo didn't believe that Express Scripts would sue because that would make the information public. No doubt in my mind that Kaleo owed this money. They just didn't want to pay it. This is for one drug. from a relatively small specialty drug manufacturer, is Evzio. The product, why it's considered specialty is really the injection mechanism. The drug inside of the pen is a generic that can be had for pennies. It's the, so it's for overdose. So look at the formulary rebates here. Now look at the administrative fees. They dwarf the formulary rebates. The administrative fees, people, is a rebate. But the wording in the PBM contract will lead you to believe it's something similar to the administrative fee you pay per claim for claims processing services. It's not. The only reason you have multiple MAC lists, the only reason you have, or I shouldn't say the only, but a big reason PBMs have multiple MAC lists, have multiple formularies, have multiple names for rebates, is to make it difficult to ascertain what their fees are, what they're charging you. It is to leverage information asymmetry, or in other words, information failure. This is from that same public filing, that same lawsuit. Look at these rebates, 40,000 for formulary, administrative fee rebates, not claims processing fees. This is administrative fees in the contracts between the PBM and the drug maker. Look at these rebates. outcomes rebates. PBMs and drug makers have entered into agreements 
where the drug makers will pay uh, a rebate back to the PBM based as long as they have an agreement for that drug based upon the drug's performance, adherence, side effects, hospitalization. So this has been going on for 10 years. And the PBMs hide it in the contract language that they're getting this money, but they also use language that says, as my client, you're not entitled to the money. It is your claims that generate this revenue to the PBM. You are entitled to that money. And I'm wrapping up here. Stay with me. The, the most important slide is coming up. The state of Ohio, two years ago, audited their PBMs, CVS and Optum. And for the first time, this is not anecdotal here, what I'm about to tell you. And for the first time, in the auditing of these PBMs, they were trying to uncover what the PBM was keeping in its bank account. What was the P for the services that it was hired to perform? What was the PBM's management fee? What were they keeping themselves? What they uncovered just in spreads. They hadn't even looked at rebates yet. In the auditor's report, which you can find online, I think I may have made a copy available for this webinar, but in the auditor's report, they express, we haven't looked at rebates, but we're getting into that next. And the reason they were able to uncover a quarter of a billion dollars in spreads, is because they were evaluating information that they never had before. I'm gonna take it one step further. Greg's trying to make it seem as if the information was never there. If he were being honest, he would say, what we're saying is, this is information we've never asked for before. That's what he would say. This is information we've never demanded before. What are you making? More facts. This is from this is from uh, CVS's CEO, from his mouth. In a 2018 earnings call, he said, "We underwrite contracts to overall level of profitability and many levers available to pull, depending on the preferences of the client." Let me put this in lamest terms for you. We are, and remember, he's saying one thing to, 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 to financial analysts and another thing to clients. Let me tell you what this says. We are going to make as much money as we possibly can. How much money we are going to make is ultimately going to depend on how sophisticated or unsophisticated our clients might be. Renaming rebate dollars is a lever. Multiple MAC lists is a lever. Multiple formularies is a lever.
medical benefit drug claims is a lever. It is the sophisticated plan sponsors who eliminate those levers to pull and leave the PBM with one, a reasonable admin fee, who will soon learn that pharmacy costs aren't really as high as you think they are. Much of that cost is what the PBM is keeping and what it's charging for the service that it's providing. The problem with that cost, and you can see that here, this is our proprietary formula for how we determine what a PBM is keeping. Everything in green at some point lands in the PBM's bank account. In red is money out or revenue out of the PBM's bank account, a reimbursement to a pharmacy, uh, a share of manufacturer revenue, or in other words, rebates. Whatever is left over is what the PBM is charging for its management fee. What do you think is going to happen when no one knows what that fee is? The problem with that fee is that it is hidden right here. It is hidden in the plan's final cost. I'm not saying that this applies to every plan because I've not evaluated every plan. What I can tell you from those I have evaluated and the sample size between me being a consultant and owning a PBM and the education I've done is that that PBM management fee, what they're putting in the bank can be as much as 70% of your total cost. You want to fix it? Here are some, some pillars in which to put on top of that foundation. Right? It's easier said than done. It's much more complicated than what you see here. But this is where you start and you start digging into these pillars. Information symmetry is the opposite of information asymmetry. You want the information to be symmetrical. You want the same information that the PBM has. And when you leverage these pillars, oh man, the results can be huge. The business school I attended is named after this gentleman. I never knew who he was all the way through school. It wasn't until after school that I read his autobiography. Who is this cat? Turns out he's the only human ever to be a founder of two Fortune 500 companies. KB Homes, Sun Life Financial. Education is the key to skyrocketing healthcare costs. I believe that in my bones. I've seen how powerful it can be. I'm wrapping up here. We offer the only credential backed by a major college that focuses on purely pharmacy benefits. That class, the next one starts in September. We have another one in January. If you're a pharmacist, life and health uh, licensee, pharmacy tech, uh, SHRM, HRCI uh, designated, we offer CE to you. All right. Uh, look that up online. Go to our website. Check it out if you're interested in learning more. With that, uh, that is the conclusion of the webinar for today. I'm going to stick around for a few minutes just in case any questions come through, but I hope you've taken away at least one thing that you can put into action today to start to eliminate overpayments to your, to your PBM, uh, either as an employer, 
or if you're an independent consulting act, acting on behalf of a client, start eliminating those overpayments today. All right, thank you for your time.